Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody to the December 2021 uh, MTT SCV virtual talk, uh, the technical presentation. This is the last technical presentation for 2021. Uh, and uh, Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Hua Wang, who is the full professor and chair of electronics at ETH Zurich. Before that, he had a very distinguished career at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, so uh, the title of today's talk uh, is Fundamentals of RF and Millimeter Wave Power Amplifier Design. Uh, welcome, Professor, and thank you for agreeing to do this talk. Uh, we will look at a few slides before uh, look at the agenda for today go to the meeting notes, uh, COVID-19 update. Uh, we just had the elections for the chapter officers. We have the results of those. Uh, so we look at the transition uh, happening uh, as we head into next year. Uh, some slides about the RFIC symposium. And uh, also uh, we have finally managed to set up our YouTube channel. We have all of our recorded talks on there and we'll look at that. And uh, after that, we'll go on to uh, the details of today's talk, and we'll have Q&A throughout. Uh, so uh, to take on the next couple of slides, I'd like to call upon uh, Tom McKay, who is our vice chair. So Tom. Thank you, Akarsh, and welcome everyone. Um, a few things to note, this meeting is being recorded and being uh, on, on live on Zoom. Um, the links, to the recorded video and slides will be sent to all registrants. Uh, look for that in a couple of days from now. Um, please please uh, keep your cameras off and microphones muted. Um, we're gonna use the raise hand reaction button uh, on Zoom for um, during the Q&A period. And then the host will unmute you so you can ask your question uh, verbally. Um, Again, uh, if you could ensure that your display name in Zoom matches the one you use to register, uh, it simplifies check-in. So thank you for that. Next slide. Uh, the COVID pandemic um, is requiring that all in-person meetings related to the chapter are canceled. Um, Monthly technical meetings and officer meetings will continue in an online and webinar format only until further notice. Uh, the uh, officers um, are shown on this slide. Uh, we are the Santa Clara Valley San Francisco chapter of the MTT Society um, of the IEEE. Um, Atkarsh Krishna is the 2021 chair um, in 2022, uh, Tom McKay, that's myself, will be chair. Uh, we just finished the election. Um, and then uh, uh, Venkata Gade will become vice chair in 2022. Um, Tan Tu will uh, continue as treasurer. And we will uh, be adding Darren Phelps, a uh, longtime Silicon Valley um, microwave uh, professional. Uh, to our team, um, and uh, yeah, we're also looking for volunteers for things like uh, webmaster and that sort of thing. So if you're interested, um, you can um, uh, reply to uh, Utkarsh's uh, email. Next slide. So uh, just want to take this opportunity to uh, congratulate uh, all the officers for next year on uh, their election and. Uh, also, I don't know if Darren's on the call, but uh, congratulations, Darren. And Darren uh, has been an officer of the chapter in the past, so uh, the chapter will be in very good hands. Uh, so congratulations, guys, and uh, we hope you continue all the good work that we've been doing here. So, yeah. uh, Akarsh, uh, you've done a tremendous job. I um, was commenting to Jay uh, on, on the phone uh, earlier that, um, you know, you've really, um, brought the chapter back to life. I really, really have been uh, inspired by your leadership. Thank you so much. Oh, so. thank you for your kind words, Tom. <laughs> but, but it's a group effort. We all did it together through some very difficult times. So uh, yeah, it's been a good, good run. 
Okay, uh, so you want to talk a bit about the RFIC symposium? Yes, um, RFIC, uh, uh, we're going to have a wonderful uh, conference uh, joint with the IMS in Denver, Colorado, the uh, 19th, uh, well, the, the week of the 19th uh, of June and, and 2022. You still have time to submit your paper um, for RFIC. The deadline is January 16th. Thanks, Akash. Okay, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'll talk a bit about this slide here. Uh, it's just a screenshot of our YouTube channel, the name of which is uh, IEEE space MTT-SCV. Uh, I have uploaded all the, it's a total of, I think, 16 uh, videos uh, so far from last year and this year. Uh, today's will be the number 17. Uh, so far, we've been uploading to the MTTS Facebook page and sending out the links to everybody. We'll keep doing that for the near future because we see a lot of traffic there. Uh, but this uh, channel is a dedicated channel for MTTS CV. Uh, so all our talks will be available. This will be like a one-stop shop for all the talks that we have done. I've organized everything into playlists based on years and topics. And uh, so I'll be sending out the links to this channel as well. Uh, when I do the post event engagement email with the links to the video. So uh, everybody should receive this one. So you can go here, you can see all our talks listed. So, and we'll be loading all our future talks on here as well. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Venkara, you wanna take this slide, uh, just explain some of the benefits for those who are not familiar. Yeah, sure. All right, hi everyone. Um, so uh, this slide uh, gives the links of, of the IEEE and MTTS chapter and uh, society. So please do become a member of IEEE and support the um, IEEE and various chapters and, and all the good work uh, put, to, to, put together by all the engineering and uh, uh, technical prof professions in IEEE. So please do join IEEE and MTTS and there is a LinkedIn hashtag MTTSCV for our chapter. So please do um, uh, subscribe. Thank you. Thank you, Venkara. So uh, before we go on to the details of the talk, I just wanted to mention, like these are the details of today's talk. Usually we don't give out this information, but I think uh, just wanted to mention how remarkable uh, the response to this event has been. We have seen like at close, we've seen like uh, 1,143 registrants uh, from uh, all seven continents, like all six continents, inhabited continents. Uh, and uh, record-breaking registrations from the US, uh, India. Uh, and I can give you some more details. Like in California, we had more than like, close to 270 registrants. And in the North Bay area, which is our kind of core area of operation, we had uh, around 150 registered. And uh, already I can see there's like 238, uh, 239, <laughs> 240 folks on the call. Number just keeps going up. Uh, so this is like a record-breaking uh, event in terms of registration and what we are seeing so far in terms of live attendance. Uh, it seems like we might just cross 250, be closer in that range. And also like uh, in terms of the number of IEEE members, non-IEEE, uh, IEEE and MTTS, it's been a record-breaking registration uh, for this event. So uh, yeah. yeah, just wanted to mention that. So with that, we'll go on to the details of today's talk, the title of which is Fundamentals of RF and Millimeter Wave Power Amplifier Design. Our speaker today is Dr. Hua Wang, who is a full professor and chair of electronics at the Department of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology Zurich, also known as ETH Zurich. He is the director of ETH Integrated Devices, Electronics and Systems, the Ideas Group. And prior to that, uh, a lot of you probably know of him. Uh, he was the associate professor with tenure at the School of Electrical, Engineer Electrical and Computer Engineering at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, in the US. Uh, he's held various uh, uh, positions there and uh, 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 I, it take quite a long time to go through all this. I'll quickly skim through the main, main details here. So uh, he's interested in a wide range of uh, RF mixed signal and analog uh, domains uh, and hybrid systems for wireless communication, sensing and so on. He has authored and, or co-authored over 200 peer reviewed journal and conference papers. Uh, he received uh, several awards, including the DARPA Director's Fellowship Award in 2020, DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2018, and so on. Uh, his research groups have won multiple academic awards and best paper awards uh, listed there. 
Uh, he's a TPC member for IEEE uh, ISSCC, RFIC, and other conferences. And uh, very important to our society, uh, he is going to be a distinguished microwave lecturer for MTTS for the term of 2022 to 2024. Uh, he is currently a distinguished lecturer for the Solid State Circuit Society for the term of uh, 2018 to 2019. And he serves as the chair of Atlanta's uh, CAS SSCS joint chapter uh, that won the Outstanding Chapter Award in 2014. Uh, so a quick abstract for today's talk. Uh, this talk will present a focused overview of millimeter wave power amplifier design in silicon, including design fundamentals, advanced PA architectures, and state-of-the-art design examples. Uh, the talk will start with an intro of PA performance metrics and their impacts on wireless systems. Next, it will present the design fundamentals of PA active devices and passive networks, as well as power combining strategies. Uh, and then also discuss advanced PA architectures, uh, hybrid PAs for high efficiency, linearity, and bandwidth. Antenna PA co designs will be covered uh, as well to uh, achieve on antenna power combining, load modulation, and reconfiguration. Uh, and finally, uh, after that and other things, we'll, the talk will conclude with uh, uh, design examples, uh, state of the art uh, millimeter wave PA design examples. So, uh, with that, uh, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Dr. Wang. Okay. Let me share my screen. So, can you see my uh, screen in the presentation mode? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with that, let's get started. And uh, thank you for a kind introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. And this is Juan from ETH Zurich. It is my pleasure to give my first MTT Distinguished, distinguished Microwave Lecture Talk for the MTT Santa Clara Valley Chapter. So my talk is on the fundamentals of RF and the military power and paper designs. So I would like to really thank and uh, Utkarsh and uh, Yudi Krishna for his kind invitation and as well as excellent organization of this, uh, of this uh, event. So I also want to thank everyone for attending my talk. All right, so here is a brief introduction of myself. I think and, uh, and the organizer already uh, gave an excellent introduction for me. So I think I want to skip it. So, uh, this is the outline of my talk, right? So in my talk, I will first talk about the background and, um, and in, as an introduction on the PA designs. So we'll explain why power amplifiers are so critical for wireless systems. So we'll also highlight several major technology needs for PAs. So with the surging of the interest in the 5G, 6G wireless, so my talk will mainly focus on millimeter power amplifier designs. Uh, but all the fundamentals are you know, applicable to both RF and the military PAs. And also for the general audience, my talk will focus mainly on the fundamentals, but we will also cover the, the state of the art as well. So next, and the, the PA basic will be introduced for the active devices and the passive network designs for a variety of designs and, uh, and the popular design examples. So after that, a section on the PA architecture will uh, introduce a, a kind of wide variety of military PA designs and examples. So following that, and we'll also present an emerging concept of this antenna PA co-design, so which can combine circuits with electromagnetic designs to really push the performance beyond conventional PA designs. So finally, a summary will conclude my talk. All right, so power amplifiers is, is the last active uh, circuit stage in our wireless transmitter to interface with antennas. So to generate sufficient signals for wireless transmission, power amplifiers are really needed in most wireless systems, so including the mobile devices, fixed point wireless, radar and imaging systems, and the satellite communications. So to really start, uh, let us uh, ask some uh, basic questions. So essentially, what is really a, a power amplifier? Or actually, maybe to be more specific, when an amplifier should be called a PA, right? Is it necessary to generate 
watt level of upper power to be considered as PAs, or, per, or perhaps and uh, for power amplifier designs, and the, these are type of amplifiers, and when the designer should not follow conventional conjugate matchings. Or maybe they are the kind of amplifiers that will have a lot of nonlinearities, right? It can cause some damages. So hopefully through this talk and uh, in the, this will, the, um, I will help you answer these questions. A general PA schematic is shown here. So this is a two-stage PA with a driver and output uh, stage together with the input interstage and output matching networks. So in general, the PA can be separated into the active, the active, active circuit design and the passive network designs. So the active circuits deal with the device performance, the power amplifier classes, and uh, waveform shapings, and the device stabilities, as well as the device reliabilities. Uh, the passive network will cover uh, impedance transformation, power combining, also waveform shaping, and the bandwidth filtering performance of the PAs. We will cover both topics and uh, later in this talk. So let us first define some very basic performance metrics of a PA and see how they will impact the performance of a wireless system. So the input power is defined as the PIN. The power at the PA device output, we define it as PPA, and the power delivered to the actual load, typically an antenna, uh, is defined as the P out or PL. The DC power is the DC power consumption total for both driver and the power stage. The power gain is the power to the load divided by the input power. So often the PA efficiency is described using drain efficiency, uh, which is the upper power divided by the DC power consumption. Also, we often use the power added efficiency in short PAE to capture the effect of the input power. So as we can see that the PAE is very important for midway PAs or any PAs when the power gain is limited. Now let us see a simple example to highlight the importance of a PA design. So let us first assume the PA drain efficiency, let's say is 40% for the entire PA. Uh, this is a commonly achievable value for many RF and high power PAs or mid midway PAs. Let's say that the upper power delivered to load is one watt or 30 dBm. Then we know that the total DC power consumption based on the definition of drain efficiency and it should be 2.5 watt. And the one watt delivered to load as a result, 1.5 watt will simply be wasted as heat. This is certainly a challenge for thermal and management as, as we can see, and how we designed the, the packaging, as well as how we and, uh, and define and extend the device operation time. So if the VDD of the PA is 2.5 volt, the total DC power current, and the total DC current then should be one amp. Then as a result, the supply and the ground metal traces and the VS should be very low, should have very low resistance to avoid DC IR job due to this huge DC uh, current. And their design should, should also mitigate any reliability issues such as electron migration. So now let's look at the output uh, network loss. If the loss is one dB, that is around 80% of penalty, then the required <clears throat> PA intrinsic drain efficiency here should be as high as almost 50%. So with one watt uh, total power delivered to the load, the RF power loss just in the upper matching network alone will be 250 milliwatt. This is essentially why the total, the low loss and the passive network design is really, really critical in PAs. Finally, let's consider the power, PA power gain. Assume the power gain is 20 dB, and that is a very common value also for the PAs to ensure sufficient gain, but also good stability. This essentially means that the input power needs to be uh, about 10 milliwatt or 10 dBm. At the millimeter wave, this is actually not trivial to generate this input power. Right? And that this will pose design challenges for the up conversion mixers. So it is useful to summarize the, the, the fundamental factors that are limiting the achievable PA efficiency in practice. In general, a PA's PAE is determined by, I would like to say, five factors. The first one is the device intrinsic efficiency. The device knee voltage is very important. And as it defines the minimum and the output voltage, the device output can swing down to. The device knee voltage and also the supply voltage 
together will limit the output RF voltage swing. The device large signal output impedance is also very critical because it will load the device output and shunt away some RF power in the large signal operation. The signal factor is the PA operation mode, but this is where we will use different PA classes and the harmonic shapings and the termination techniques and so on and so forth. So often this is here, this, this factor is the reason why PA design is often called waveform engineering. The third factor is the device power gain. It determines the required input power and uh, will determine and govern the PAE. Again, when the active device and when the active device does not have sufficient power gain, for example, PA designs for high millimeter wave applications, this factor will become more and more significant, as we can see. The fourth factor is the PA output and the network loss. In the previous examples, we have seen that the, how the loss will impact the PA efficiency. Right? In addition, for differential PAs, uh, the, the output network, the balancing of the, of the output network is also critical as well, so that we can have efficient power combining. Finally, the PA efficiency is also determined by the thermal effects, device aging, and the reliabilities and, and other factors. But due to the limited scope here, and we will not uh, cover all these aspects in this talk, but the, nevertheless, they are really critical for PA designs as well. So for PA designs, we need to specify the output power level, right? So we can really define our design goal. The PA output power is typically determined by the regulation and the link budget specified by the freeze transmission and the equation. So if we know the required to receive the power and then again, the distance and the carrier wavelengths, the carrier frequency, the required power and the, therefore can be calculated as the PA of the power. For the, R, for the RF frequency PAs, the typical power levels are often between somewhere 20 to 26 dBm, really depending on the standards. So with some exceptions such as low power Bluetooth and uh, low energy applications. So, but for the millimeter PAs, the required PA upper power actually has a direct relationship with array size since we often will use phase arrays or MIMO arrays. And um, as well as the total and the ERP, which stands for the equivalent isotropically rated power. So given an ERP, a small array will require uh, larger and the PA of a power because we have less number of elements. On the other hand, for a larger array, and uh, we can reduce the element level PA uh, uh, of a power requirement, but it will need a large panel size, a sharper beam, and uh, more system overhead, and a complicated beam forming and the tracking and the algorithms. So in this table, the element level PA of a power values for different applications are actually shown here. And we can see that they have direct relationship with the required ERP and their array size. So next, I would like to highlight several technology needs or challenges for high performance PAs. It is quite useful to see the state of the art and the power generation capabilities by using solid state electronics. So my group develops a PA survey on the PAs and in different technologies and uh, reported since 2000. So the upper power of the reported PAs and in different technologies are plotted here versus the uh, carrier frequency. At the lower frequency, the upper power is typically limited by the application and the regulations. And when the frequency goes higher, we start to see an interesting and a monotonic decrease of upper power and due to the device limitations. And also interestingly, this trend roughly follows this minus 20 dB per decay, and that matches well with the device Johnson limit. This plot is useful for uh, on the system level designs to estimate achievable PA of a power for a given technology at a given frequency. So in summary, it is indeed challenging to achieve high of a power for high frequency applications. Right. That's the first challenge. The signal challenge is the output power versus the efficiency. The silicon devices we know have very limited output power capabilities and the limited voltage swing. So for a larger output power, one will need to increase the output uh, RF current as well as reduce the load resistance. This means we need a larger device or we need to put more devices in parallel. This also requires a larger impedance transformation and the ratio by the PA output matching network. 
So both of these requirements will actually introduce more loss and the degraded overall efficiency. The figure on the right summarizes the peak PA and PAE versus the maximum upper power for reported 20 to 50 dB in gigahertz and the PAs in silicon. At the low power level, the PA, PAE is around a constant value of around 45%. Some of the designs can be slightly higher to 50% for the 20 to 50 gigahertz PAs, which is really defined and limited by the silicon device and the intrinsic efficiency and the passive loss of the network. I call this region as a device limited regime. However, when we move to a higher upper power, for example, 23 dBm and above in this case, we'll see a very sharp and rapid degradation of the efficiency versus the upper power. This is because the single silicon devices can no longer deliver such a high upper power. So more devices and will be needed and more complex passive combiners will be needed and which together will introduce more power loss and a degraded efficiency. So I call this region as the combiner and the network limited regime. So therefore, we can see that it is challenging to achieve PAs with high upper power, high efficiency, and a compact area uh, all at the same time. The next challenge is the trade-off of PA spectrum efficiency, linearity, and energy efficiency. So spectrally efficient and the wideband modulations, such as high order qualms and the OFDM signals are widely used to boost the throughput and the in wireless communication applications. And even for radar and sensing, the complete waveforms such as OFDM uh, start to be used to advance the, the sensing capabilities, as we can see. So these complicated waveforms, as we know, typically will require a uh, higher PA linearity so that they, we can resolve these constellations. So therefore, there is really the need for PA to support both high linearity and also high data rate at the same time which is also a challenge. But at the same time, for the PA designs, we know that the linearity and efficiency, and they always go hand in hand. These complex, all these complex modulations will often have large peak to average power ratio, PAPR. The figure on the left shows the envelope signal of a one gigasymbol per second, 64 qualms in the modulation signal. The probability density function and the, of the envelope is shown on the right versus the power and the backup levels. As we can see that the majority of the power is actually located around this 6.5 dB of backup average and close to its PAPR. Uh, however, most of the PAs actually achieve their high, highest efficiency at the maximum of the power. So they are designed to behave like that. So a theoretical class BPA and the backup efficiency versus the, current, the up and backup power level curve and is actually also plotted here. As we can see that at a 6 dB power backup and uh, the, the efficiency of the PA is only half of its peak value. So we can define the average PA efficiency therefore as the integration of the PA backup efficiency weighted by the envelope probability density function of, for the particular modulation. And this is at the actual efficiency when amplifying the, the modulated signal for the PA, which is often more important than the PA CW peak efficiency, especially for wireless communication applications. So therefore, we can see that there is this critical need to realize high PA backup efficiency together with high linearity. So finally, the spectrum is crowded, we know, at the gigahertz frequency. And the, for the millimeter frequency, and often, and, uh, and the uh, multiple non-contiguous bands are being assigned. So for example, for the millimeter 5G applications and uh, uh, different bands are being used in different countries and regions to really support this multi-band and multi-mode and the international low limit capabilities, the wideband or frequency reconfigurable PAs are often needed. But on the other hand, we know that broadband operations often will have trade-offs with upper power and efficiency, which is particularly true for PAs. So that actually posed um, also as a challenge. So to summarize and everything together, we can use a kind of PA design and a hexagon to highlight all the challenges uh, and the trade-offs among the, these performance metrics. So this level of complexity, I would like to say, really makes the PA designs both challenging and full of innovation of opportunities. We can actually delve deeper into the state-of-the-art PA performance based on our PA survey. 
Right. You can download the, the most updated version six and the peer survey and using this link is uh, public available online. So uh, we can use the millimeter PAs of between uh, 20 to 50 gigahertz to better visualize the trade-off, especially between the PA output power and the PAE. Right? The X axis is the output power and the Y axis is the, the peak PAE. So as I mentioned, for the silicon PA design, we can see that the medium on the or low power level the best achievable PAE around this frequency is actually around 45% for both CMOS and CDPAs in this and the device limited regime. To improve the efficiency here, we really need to improve the devices themselves, or we should look at how best we can shape the large signal waveforms and how best we can use the device in the large signal operations. And for example, a different type of harmonic terminations. On the other hand, once we move to the higher upper power levels, and the PAE drops, as we have seen, sharply in this combiner or network limited regime. So the, the infection point and for silicon-based PAs, interestingly, is around 22, 22 to 23 dBm. So again, this is where we should explore new circuit innovations and for better power combinings and to close and to, to so that we can really close the, the efficiency gap between these high uh, power PAs versus the, the device limited the, the, the PAE values. So if we may record the PA upper power versus array size and the four millimeter PAs, we can see that in many applications, including the handset and some base stations, and, and the, 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 they have already set the millimeter PA power requirement close or even lower than this value of 23 dBm. So I'm not sure whether this was actually set intentionally or coincidentally, but nevertheless, this upper power level suggests that the silicon will be a capable technology platform for these millimeter PA applications. So to deliver such low to medium power level with a very competitive efficiency. At the same time, if we, look, we, may, if we may look at the three, five PAs at this frequency range, the gas PAs typically can generate more than five to 10 dB upper power than the silicon PAs. While the gallium nitride PAs can generate more than let's say 15 to 20 dB of upper power and really reach the power level of over 45 dBm around this frequency. So now, if, again, if we look at this uh, PA upper power versus array and the size summary, we can see that these three, five technologies are really and uh, needed for high power and the base station applications. So there are a lot of exciting R&D and uh, activities, especially on millimeter GAN PAs recently. So they will play a big role and in 5G and potentially beyond 5G applications, I believe. Due to the limited focus of this talk, and uh, we will actually not be able to cover and, uh, and, uh, these three, five and uh, PAs here in this talk. But for those who are interested, I encourage you to look at the recent liter literatures and uh, learn the new designs and new advances. So we have just a look at the, and the continuous wave and the, the performance summary for the reported PAs. Uh, regarding the, the PAE versus the upper power and the trade-off. But as we mentioned that the, if we intend to use the PAs for typically for wireless communication applications, the modulation performance is even more important. So this plot actually summarizes the, the, the reported 20 to 50 gigahertz and the CMOS CD PAs with 64 quantum modulation test. So we may look at the, the designs with a uh, high speed modulation. And uh, here we mainly look at designs with, uh, with high speed modulation at least with 100 mega symbol per second. So the X axis here is now is the average upper power while the Y axis is the average efficiency. So both doing the modulations. So recently the best report the PAE and average PAE is not above 25% with an average upper power around 15 to 16 dBm. So on the peer research, I would like to say it will be interesting to, to see if we can push this value to really to, to call this, uh, to this so-called 20 to 20 performance. Essentially 20 dBm average upper power with 20% 20, 20 of average efficiency. That will be interesting to see. <clears throat> Going back and look at this um, PA, uh, again, upper power versus an uh, array size chart. So we can see that the recent PA technologies can address the 50, address the 20% of required average PAE efficiency requirement already. So on the other hand, if we compare the modulated performance versus the CW performance of millimeter PAs in this frequency, 
clearly there, uh, there are huge differences in terms of energy efficiency and also average of power. To improve the average efficiency and energy efficiency, we really need to investigate new PE architectures and the linearization techniques so that we can minimize the unnecessary power backoffs. This is actually where the architectures such as Doherty PAs and the outfacing PAs will really shine. So, but to boost the average of the power, it is very important to look at the new linearization techniques and also new power combining techniques, <clears throat> as well as PA reconfiguration, and to ensure its linearity with uh, complete power combining and, uh, and even over PBT and the variations. So therefore, again, in my opinion, there is plenty of space for research innovations on power amplifiers, as we can see. Um, if we want to understand the cons constraints on PAs for high millimeter applications, right? For so-called the 6G or the beyond 5G or 6G applications, I believe we really need to put them in the context of arrays because for those applications, we'll just pretty much use arrays almost at all the applications. So this is well known. It is well known that if we have a perfect beam forming with an array of n elements, so the total radiated power and uh, the will be increased by 10 log n, right? While the total ERP will, will be enhanced by 20 log n with another 10 log n as the array and the gain. On the receiver side, the receiver array and SNR and also the noise figure will be enhanced by 10 log n as well. So therefore, if we use both TX and RX arrays to form a wireless link, the link budget will increase by 30 log n. That's really the benefit. But of course, at the same time, we need to be aware of the price we are paying. The total power consumption now increases by a factor of n, right? This res the, the resulting thermal effects will directly impact how we choose the packaging technologies and the cooling solutions. The array panel size and also increases by a factor of n, right? which may be limited by the actu actual applications. For example, some of the mobile applications, we just cannot afford to have a large boom factor and uh, for the entire an uh, antenna panel. At the same time, array the main lobe beam width and will reduce by a factor of n. This may, be, uh, this may be fine for some static applications, but it will substantially increase the TXRX beam alignment challenges in mobile applications. And uh, uh, in particular, those applications where the, the, the environment, uh, environments are dynamic and often unknown. So, well, we may wonder uh, what will happen when we are building arrays for uh, sub terahertz and 60 applications. So in particular, if we keep the same array panel size, what is the link budget if we scale the array to higher and higher frequency? So we know the path loss and the based on free transmission formula is inversely proportional to the frequency. So if we keep the array panel size the same, we may assume that the, 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 if the, the, the element size will, will scale with the wavelength, and then it, can, it will be inversely proportional to the frequency. So in this case, the total element number for the same array panel size of the TX and RRX array will increase proportionally to the frequency. Right? Then we can find that the total link budget we can calculate uh, considering and, uh, and, uh, both and, uh, these factors Will be, uh, will be increasing to the power of four of the carrier frequency. This, this result actually interesting is suggesting that uh, and the higher the frequency we go, the better the wireless link will have. So this is also the result that is often being quoted in many uh, system level papers and the invited talks. But the question that it is really true, it really depends on many important assumptions here, right? First of all, it assumes that the, the trend, the TX element of power should be constant versus the frequency. The TX R and the, the element efficiency should also be constant versus the frequency. And the receiver element noise figure should be constant over frequency. And the array element size should indeed be an, an scale, scaled inversely proportional to the frequency. However, we know that the TX of power decreases sharply with frequency as we just seen on a PS survey. The, P and the transmitter efficiency and also RF noise figure both will degrade rapidly over frequency as well. Well, the last thing we want to check that what about the assumption of this array element size? So my research group also did another survey on, the, on this on the particular topic. 
the x axis here is the carry frequency, while the y axis here is the, and the dimension of a full TX and RX array element. Right? So basically, co the element and uh, including both TX and RX in the same element. So we can look at the, we look at the papers and the published in the recent 10 to 15 years that have reported manipulative arrays using an integrated circuits. They are placed as the red, red dots on these figures, okay? Each red dot representing the, the data from one paper. So at the same time, we can assume that the lemma rule two in the air is the desired array elements so that we can avoid any grading lobes when we are putting together an array. So we can draw it and this uh, over the carry frequency shown here as the blue curve. Okay, we can see that for the lower millimeter frequency, the reported array element size, they are actually below this blue curve. And this is great. This means that they can be implemented in a 2D scalable array, not a problem. And in our assumption, we expect the element size to decrease with the frequency. And we can see that this is probably true up to from lower frequency up to 50 gigahertz. But then the array element size actually start to increase versus the frequency. The crossing point as of today is around 70 to 100 gigahertz, meaning that beyond this frequency, we even cannot fit a full transceiver element in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the array lattice. So why that? So of course, there are several reasons. And the, one of them is really because the device do not have sufficient power gain anymore beyond 100 gigahertz. So often we need to cascade many stages. This is particularly true for power and play bars, right? In addition, many uncompact the lumped passive uh, and components have limited self resonant frequency and for the higher and higher frequency. So they need to be replaced by distributed passives, which are actually larger. As we can see that in the higher frequency, you will see more primary fires are being built by using transmission lines and which actually will cause more area. So uh, I believe that the, the technology innovation and the more research eventually will help, help us push this crossing point to a higher and higher frequency. But anyway, it is clear that uh, as of today, and I believe, and in the future, that the reported transceiver elements size are actually will be constant or even increasing for at higher frequency because of these limitations. <clears throat> so a few um, a few um, the points for the individual building blocks at higher frequency are also being plotted here, which again shows that the size are really large compared to the wavelengths at the minimum frequency. So by the way, uh, maybe as a side topic. And uh, this plot may also give us some insights on the weather and how the arrays should be built and uh, with the with antennas. Essentially, shall we place on chip antennas or shall we use and uh, and uh, on package antennas? So interestingly, for lower than 70 to 100 gigahertz, the on chip antennas may be uh, considered to be too large and not economical for implementations on chip. But above 100 gigahertz, we can see that. And we even don't have a lot of space and in the array lattice to fit all the electronics, let alone any on-chip antennas, unless we can come up with very compact on-chip antennas. So therefore, in most and actually 2D scalable and commercially viable arrays, it probably makes sense to place antennas on package as of today. So I, therefore, I believe that the, the package research and the heterogeneous integration are really essential for future and the 6G and the array and uh, systems. So finally, I also want to talk about the power density since we, have, we were considering the size. Let's talk about power density. So a common way to describe the, the power density and uh, is, is essentially using this aspect for the device power and the capabilities, which is defined as the watt per millimeter. So P set divided by device peripheral size. Uh, this is a function of the device parameters such as the maximum drain and the voltage during current density and the frequency and so on and so forth. This metric is often being used in the 3.5 compound semiconductor and the PA community. And it is a very, um, is, it is a very good device centric metric that can be used to compare different device technologies and their intrinsic power generation capabilities. But on the other hand, we can actually define another power density and metric as the saturated upper power divided by the, 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 the PA core area. So essentially watt per millimeter square. It is not only a function of the device and watt per millimeter metric, but also it depends on the backend quality, <clears throat> the layout compactness, and also the PA topologies. So therefore the millimeter square density 
is actually more a circuit centric metric instead of a device centric metric. So which can, this can be used to really compare different circuits and plan the system level architectures for the transmitters and also an entire array. Since we are, limit, we are, limit, we are being really limited on the, on the size for higher, higher frequency applications. So, well, there are also other useful applications of this watt per millimeter square metric, right? Of course, for example, it tells us uh, the, 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 the area efficiency of different technologies when generating a certain RF, RF of power, of course. And conversely, and given the chip area, and we can actually estimate the achievable PL power. This is very useful for array based planning. Once we know the array frequency, we kind of know the array letter size based on level two in the air of the size. Then we can assign certain percentage of the area of the element uh, of the array element size for the P8. Then we can based on the using the, the watt per millimeter square metric based on the, the, the literature survey, we can kind of estimate what is the set of upper power we can generate per P8. And then now for a given array ERP, we kind of can estimate what will be the array element to meet the ERP requirement. Then we will know what's the panel size we, we have to go for and to, to meet that target. Uh, so in addition, if we actually note the chip cost as, as a dollar per minute square, then we can use this watt per minute square metric to calculate the, the cost to generate the target of power as the watt per dollar, for example. That's another application of this metric. So let's see what 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 we, what is the power density and as a watt per meter square uh, have been reported for integrated PAs above, for example, 90 gigahertz. If we care about these higher higher frequency applications, so this plot summarizes reported PAs in CMOS, CG, galenitride, and also India phosphate from 2000 to, uh, to present. So. Um, the, by the way, this power density data is also available and, uh, and as a new feature in our in the PA survey version six, you can download again online. We can see that regardless of the technology right, and the watt per minute square and the, and the metric will decrease over the frequency. So these two dashed lines are essentially the kind of the AMDO curves for the Indian phosphate technology and also CMOS technologies. Uh, by the way, although it's not being shown here, the watt per millimeter in millimeter in the square and the metric also decreases with p set due to the overhead and the loss of complex power combiners and this is this makes sense right and also for the indian phosphate ps we can see that it has the highest watt per millimeter square density at this high frequency above 90 gigahertz applications this makes sense and um, and and uh, uh, and this is really due to the high gain of these indian phosphate devices so in addition, some of the GAN PAs achieve the highest P set and the watt power and the watt level of, of the power, which also makes sense. We know that. But however, if we look at the watt per uh, the power density as a watt per minute square for the GAN and the, and the devices versus silicon devices, we actually see and it's actually very interesting to see that some of the CMOS designs actually achieve similar or even better watt per minute square density than the GAN PAs. So this is true even after removing some of the, the outlier points of silicon designs, and we can still see this interesting trend. So to me, this is actually quite counterintuitive, right? Because since the GAN PS we all know typically will have about 15 to 20 times better watt per millimeter capabilities and CMOS devices at this frequency. However, apparently this advantage at the device level is not really showing up in the watt per, in the watt per millimeter square metric at a circuit level at all. So, but if we look closely on this and, and the difference, we can see that the CMOS technology typically will support much uh, more compact layout for both active devices and the passive uh, components. For example, the device uh, layout uh, has less overhead, so we can place two or multiple devices very close to each other compared to the GAN devices. So moreover, the CMOS technologies will typically support more versatile backend options, more backend layers. This will allow us to implement compact and high coupling passive networks and passive components. And uh, this again shows that the unique capabilities of silicon technologies and for these very high frequency millimeter wave and applications. But, but at the same time, I know that there have been uh, new research efforts and uh, such as the US and the DARPA, the new ELGA program, and, and focusing on 
in how to improve the watt per minute square power density performance of 3 5 compound uh, technologies, especially at these sub-millimeter frequency, for example, 230 gigahertz and 240 gigahertz. So we will see a very interesting research coming up in the next several years. So, but in summary, the existing integrated in the, in the TA and TRX array elements actually do not scale with the frequency if we are talking about these very high frequency applications. So we actually see a crossing point at around 70 to 100 gigahertz, right? So uh, as a result, the high millimeter PAs for these beyond 5G and 6G applications we, and we need to focus on all the more traditional PA metrics, but at the same time, they need to be very compact. They need to be energy efficient and also area efficient at the same time. So I'm sure that this will actually stimulate the new innovations on the devices and the circuits and system and packaging levels and so on and so forth in the future. So I think with that, I want to take a, and a short break. So to see if um, there are any questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so folks, uh, please go ahead and use the reaction button. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. So go ahead. Uh, Guang Xiang Li, uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the talk uh, so far. So uh, I have one question. You mentioned about uh, for the next PA, people could push to even higher frequency than the current standard 5G or even beyond. So uh, like you mentioned 200 something, you know, more than 200G. So my question is uh, for the current uh, wireless um, technology, like uh, I think uh, if you push to that, much high frequency, uh, the pulse loss will be very dramatically. Uh, so how, you know, I mean, just uh, curious how the future wise technology can follow up with the device innovation or the co, co go together with, you know, hand by hand to, uh, to de deliver the, um, the, the future customer, customer need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's an excellent question, right? So I think that the question is touched bases on two aspects. One is what is the application? The second thing that uh, do we have devices that support this high frequency, right? I would like to say that, uh, you know, regarding applications, it is still, um, in, the, in, the, it is still in, the, in, the, in the forming phase, right? It's not very clear, but certainly people are talking about a variety of applications such as uh, uh, and the indoor or the short range and the, and, the, and the wireless communication with very high data rates. For example, something called the information shower, and that is put in, that is one possible user user case. Another application is the near range and the very fine resolution and the, the sensing and the imaging. That's certainly another possible application. Regarding the devices, and the, that's a very good, that's an excellent and uh, question. As we can see that the PA designs and actually in general, all the front-end electronic designs really depends on the, and the for these high frequency application, really depends on the capability of devices, essentially FTF medical devices, right? So I think there have been research ongoing now to really push um, the, the device and the frequency, uh, the device operating frequency to, to a higher frequency so that we can support and, uh, these applications. Thank you, Professor. Oh, well, ne so. uh, yep. Next question, uh, Nazif Farid, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Professor. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question is, uh, is wire bonding still a thing now for millimeter wave PAs or is flip chip the future? I'm asking because I'm not sure what the cost gap is between flip chip and, and wire bonding. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's a good question. So I think and I will mainly uh, comment from a performance perspective, right? I think we have been seeing on the wire bonding based PAs and uh, up to 20 gigahertz or even higher frequency. And that this seem to be, and the, from performance perspective, still a viable option. Going to a higher and a higher frequency and that we, we actually see more and more common use of uh, fleet chip packaging, right? And this, that which also allows us to have more and dense wiring and with less couplings. Yeah, I have seen that the, in the research groups, they have demonstrated the, and the fleet chip bonding and the based packaging to uh, 150 gigahertz or even higher frequency, as long as we can minimize the, 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 the fleet uh, packaging, the, the bump. Yeah. 
and all can take that the parasitics into consideration in the design is possible. Thank you, Professor. Next question, yep. uh, Rafael Perez Martinez, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, Dr. Wang. I have a question hello. about uh, three five devices in particular. Uh, can you can you talk more about uh, linearity performance between silicon based PAs and then 3.5 such as gallium arsenide and gallium nitride PAs? I know that GAN has like this this thing called soft compression and that affects linearity to some extent. Can you comment more on that and if it's possible to actually push the linearity performance even more, especially during modulation? So oh, that's a that's a great question. So I think and uh, uh, that's that's a great question. So um, indeed, and the the, and the compound semiconductors in particular, I would like to say, can have this uh, soft compression and uh, and the issues, right? In the sense that you will see and the sharp drop of AM to AM and uh, and the, and the, uh, even well before the, the P set. So I think and the, uh, on that there are different circuit techniques that can uh, hopefully and uh, and uh, compensate for that. Um, and then uh, at the same time, I'm sure you probably are aware that uh, there, uh, there are new device engineering that can kind of improve this aspect. But I also at the same time, and there have been research on the digital sign and the signal and the processing or digital pre-distortion to correct that. But all of these first and the, and the auxiliary techniques will really depend on the modulation rate. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Next question is from Rui Jia Liu. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hello, Professor Wang. Hello. Um, uh, I have one question. Um, this question confused me for a very long time. That is, uh, uh, for, uh, for the 3.5 compound device, for example, the gallium nitride, it, it is very common that um, at a low frequency, its uh, drain voltage can be um, 28 voltage or even higher, but it is very difficult for some millimeter wave uh, applications. For example, the 0 0.55 process, the drain voltage is typically uh, 20 voltage. Uh, can, can, can you give me some, some reason? Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, I'm not sure if I really understand your question. Can you kind of rephrase your question? So, and uh, we know that the indeed, yeah, GAN devices typically they will have higher supply voltages, right? There are different type of GAN devices, and uh, and uh, and uh, some of them they they have because of the intrinsic and the kind of uh, 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 Johnson limit trade off, and you can design redesign the devices so that it has a lower and the voltage, but uh, can give you a higher frequency. And uh, is that something you are referring to, or can you please rephrase your question? Oh, okay. My question is: uh, It seems that uh, some gallium nitride process at the millimeter wave frequency is hard to have a very high um, drain supply voltage. For example, uh, its voltage is limited to about twenty voltage volt. Uh, and uh, uh, for some sub six gigahertz applications, for example, the zero two point five uh, micron process, its typical drain supply voltage can even high to twenty eight or, or or even higher. Uh. Okay, sure. I would like to say maybe the simplest answer is that this really follows the, 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 the classic and, uh, and to the first order, and maybe even to the zeroth order, the Johnson limit, right? You can, using the same material, you can re-engineer the device and to have a trade-off between the, by sizing, to have a trade-off between the breakdown voltage versus the operating frequency. If you want the device to operate a higher frequency, you have to have higher FDF max. As a result, the, the, your, your breakdown voltage need to decrease. Yep, thank you, Professor. Uh, Renuka, go ahead, ask your question. Hello, Dr. Wong. The, that's a very interesting talk. I have a quick question. In one of your previous slides, uh, you mentioned that the output uh, matching network loss is close to 250 millivolts. Uh, watts. 
so quick question so is uh, is the matching network is also built on the same substrate like silicon or uh, silicon or germanium substrate or is it will be on a different one if so if there is any research going on on how to minimize this losses oh absolutely this is an excellent excellent question so i think you are referring to this particular slide right we are talking about let's say i assume that 1 db loss of the matching network which will give you like 80% of the and the, the power will actually go to the load, 20% of penalty. And here, I'm just giving a generic number of 1 dB loss, right? In reality, it depends on applications, right? For these um, uh, and, uh, uh, RFPAs, uh, uh, you, you can choose to design the upper mesh network on chip. You can also choose to design the upper mesh network on, uh, off chip on the package, on the board. And the, both of them, they are viable, very viable. Even for some of the military applications, and, and uh, there have been research ongoing and uh, for uh, the, the, the uh, designing the, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve this passive mesh network on the package or through the, the, and the you know, 3D integration, heterogeneous integration. This is also possible. Even on the same substrate, there are different ways to do it too. Right, and uh, so let's say if we are using the SOI substrate with high resistivity, typically that give you uh, a little bit less loss in the passive network, and uh, that will help you reduce the the, the 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 power penalty here as well. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, Timothy Lee, uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Wow, well, this is Tim Lee. Uh, good to see you. Hello, Tim. Uh, my question to you is, given that the gain of the devices um, keeps going down versus frequency, uh, you know, above 100 gigahertz to 200, 300 gigahertz, so what is the maximum um, op DC operating mode do you think it's usable? I mean, obviously you can do class A, class B, but some of your hybrid order mode eventually for switching mode, are they still useful or you really cannot use those modes? Okay, uh, Tim, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So, and typically, rule of thumb, and we, we as a PA designer, we often use, uh, really depends on how much we are willing to sacrifice the efficiency and also the gain, right? So let's say we want to have reasonable gain, still reasonable efficiency. And, uh, and typically, we want in the for class A operation, we want to make sure that the, our operation, uh, it will be no more than typically one third of your Fmax. Right, so whatever device F max, we divide by three, and that will be uh, the, the class A of uh, frequency of operation, right? So therefore, if we are talking about uh, and, uh, and the device with F max of 450 gigahertz, we, the, we probably want to operate around 100, maximum 150 gigahertz. And sometimes different techniques will help us to improve it. But as you mentioned, when we go to those more switching and the, the, the topologies, <coughs> And uh, we we just have we just have to throw away the gain even further. Then then that may all, may not be viable anymore. So I think one third of the F max is a good guideline to start with. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Henry Hu, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, Professor Wang. Hello. Thank you for giving us the talk and. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you are still in Europe. If you are, then we really appreciate you working in your late, let's say midnight, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, I have two questions. The first question is, can you make a general comment on this? I think there's two technologies, gallium nitride on silicon carbide and then gallium nitride on silicon. Can you make a general comment to see which, um, technology will succeed in the future in commercialized, in let's say, in wireless infrastructure for commercialization. And then the, the second question I have is, uh, there was some issues on, let's say, hysteresis issues on the compound semiconductors when applying the DPD. Um, can you make a comment and uh, how to address that, uh, if, if it can be addressed? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, Henry, good question. So I have to say that I'm not an expert in um, the, the common semiconductor PAs and uh, compared to our experience in the silicon-based PAs. So I think, and uh, I'm afraid that, that I don't want to give you, uh, the, that I don't want to give you misleading answers. 
So for these, and the, 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 your questions are very specific for carbon, carbon semiconductor PAs. Maybe we, you and I, we can discuss offline. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What about the hysteresis? Because uh, for example, on the LDMOS, we do not see this when, in, when applying the uh, DPDs, but on some of the sem compound semiconductor, we, we see that. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think this is something to do with, I believe this is something to do with the, uh, the, uh, the device level memory effects and also thermal effects, right? So uh, I think in the, uh, uh, um, this is more towards the, 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 the DPD techniques, yeah. Okay, uh, Fabio Bani, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Professor Wang, I wanted to ask um, a little bit about um, the connection between heat and power density. Now, we know, or as far as I'm aware, that uh, the problem, the main problem related to heat and power losses is not uh, the efficiency in itself, but the fact that uh, this heat, this generated heat, distorts the functioning of the device. Uh, mm -hmm. if, it is, if it is an active device or it generates noise, if it is a passive device resistance, etc. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of power density, so if we shrink the layout more and more and more, uh, heat, of course, might be able to spread more easily. Uh, is that a concern in a power amplifier design? Thanks. Uh, that's a good question, and uh, certainly that's a concern, right? And uh, when we start to increase the, the power, uh, when we are to start to in, uh, engineer our devices as well as, as well as the circuits to include the bar per millimeter, per millimeter square and the metric, we'll actually see that uh, the, we will start to hit the wall of the thermal dissipations. So I think that is essentially something, you know, we need to know the motivation why we want to increase the watt per millimeter square because we want to, especially for higher frequency application, we want to fit into the array. So that size, which is a hard limit. So as a result, it will create a problem of heat dissipation. And then therefore we need to come up with new actually packaging or cooling techniques that we can actually carry the heat away. So this is just something that a resulting and the task we have to and, uh, you know, and uh, explore. That's a good question, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chuan Shi, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Wang, uh, this is Chuan. Uh, so actually I, I have a question regarding the uh, PA with range uh, from 70 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. So with, range, with, with this range of frequency, uh, so if we want to design a PA with directly power combining with phase arrays, uh, so, uh, how will we, for example, if we choose a different classes of the PA, we need to engineer different uh, impedance for the harmonic frequency. So in, in this range of the frequency, when we directly using the antennas, so do we need like the uh, extra element for the power combining uh, output network for the PA to engineer the harmonics? And if we do, um, so I'm just want to make sure, so is this a kind of a network that's still based on transmission line based network or we need to use some kind of waveguide structure to engineer like that. Okay, yeah, sure. So I think if I understand your question correctly, uh, I think it, um, for this uh, frequency of PA designs, it depends on applications, right? So uh, if we have, uh, let's assume that we have large size of array and uh, then we don't have to do, uh, and, uh, and then we can actually design each PA elements with a relatively moderate output power. And uh, at this frequency, I have seen designs, especially in silicon and uh, around maybe 20 dBm or uh, you know, that is, has been reported. And uh, there are designs which achieve even higher output power. So at this power level, okay, uh, it is certainly possible to do power combining and, uh, and, uh, and the, to do some kind of harmonic waveform shaping. Probably not a lot of harmonics, and, uh, but and you can still have some kind of harmonics wave, waveform shaping, typically at least like second order harmonics. So um, regarding your question, whether we should use the transformers or transmission lines or lumped elements, uh, I have seen both, honestly. I have seen and the both and, the, and, the, and the, I think the, 
transformers and the basic designs, they are pretty popular even at this frequency. Uh, they start to fall short at higher frequencies. But at this frequency, 70 to 100 gigahertz, you, you, we have seen transformer designs. And we have also seen compact even coupler designs, which actually my group, we have, we have designed several and, uh, examples too. Um, and the pure transmission line designs and uh, uh, for, the, for example, the micro strip lines, they are being used at this frequency as well, especially in the earlier kind of uh, the exploration for high frequency millimeter PAs. Uh, and because they are, uh, they lend themselves to, to very easy modeling. Uh, they are also particularly useful for the process where you don't have a lot of metal layers. Uh, that's very useful too. So, but I think from a design, being divine, you know, compact design perspective, and still lumped elements and the transformers or some kind of compact couplers will still be uh, uh, and uh, probably a more preferred choice. Thank you. Ibrahim uh, Chamas, please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Can you hear? Yes. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, Ray. Uh, uh, so my question is for this equation for the power added efficiency. Um, I, I'd like to see also the impact of the bandwidth mode, right? Because you can operate at five gigahertz and use 20 megahertz bandwidth mode, or you can operate at one gigahertz and use 200 megahertz bandwidth mode. And that makes the design more challenging. So, you know, specifically when you do DPD uh, and you need to operate a 3x the bandwidth or sometimes 4x the bandwidth uh, mm -hmm. for the at least the pre PA uh, matching networks and all of this. So, what are the solutions to operate at large bandwidth mode, not just high frequencies? Sorry, and uh, and uh, and uh, I think and uh, can you rephrase your question? I guess you're talking about the bandwidth versus the efficiency. Yeah, the bandwidth, right? Because, for example, as I mentioned, like when you want to do DPD, you want to operate at three x the bandwidth, so even four x the bandwidth. So the fractional bandwidth becomes sometimes the challenging design metric, uh, not just the operating frequency. And uh, you know, if you want a wide bandwidth, then you want low Q, and that degrades the efficiency. Is that is that trade-off has been broken in some design, some ideas that you are aware of? Sure, sure. Uh, that's, and that's an ex excellent question, right? So uh, I think, let, let, let's say we are talking about, let's, let's just for, let's just take the, and, uh, and, uh, an example PA with 30 gigahertz of uh, uh, carrier frequency, right? So uh, it really, I think it really depends on applications. If we are talking about 100, 200 megahertz of modulation bandwidth, or even three times of that, uh, that is still much lower than, you know, 10% of the carry frequency bandwidth. For a PA with 10% of bandwidth, typically we don't, you know, in most applications, and uh, we don't have to uh, make extra efforts to broaden the bandwidth. You will get that bandwidth more or less and, uh, and uh, directly if you do the design you know, right, uh, using relatively advanced process and, uh, and, uh, and uh, reasonable practice. So your question really comes into, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think the picture, when we are talking about the modulation frequency of multi gigahertz of a bandwidth, I think that is possible. Uh, if we, you want to do, let's say, multi-tone and, uh, and the PAs and the massive, I don't know, uh, carrier aggregations. And in that case, that, that will indeed face a lot of challenges, right? The DPD, as you mentioned, and, uh, and, uh, and actually will have even all, that will also have challenges about how we define the, the how we design the bias network that will not interfere with the, and, uh, with the, uh, 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 with basically signal path, right? And if we want to have active load, uh, active load modulation or active uh, the, the biasing network, adaptive uh, biasing network, they need, their response need to be fast enough. But typically, if we are talking about 100 megahertz and uh, also applications, and uh, from a PA pers design perspective, from load the Q perspective, and the four millimeter PAs, this is typically not a concern. Uh, even for even up to several hundred uh, several hundreds of megahertz, this is okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. The questions are still there. Uh, I, I suggest we proceed uh, with the rest of the talk, and uh, we can come back to the Q and A later. Please hold on to your questions, uh, and uh, we can ask them at the next Q and A slot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.